Thank you for tuning in this week. It's going to be a very good half hour together. You'll be glad that you were with me. And so what I'm going to do today, I'm going to pick up on something I touched on on the previous program. You know, the Apostle Paul gives us so much revelation of what God has provided for us. But then parallel with that, there are certain warnings. And, and, and I, I quoted such a warning in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, where, where the mighty apostle says, lest I myself should become a castaway. If you look at the root word there, it also really means lest I should do damage to myself, lest I should be a forfeiter. To forfeit something means you really have it, but, but you kind of let it go. Maybe it's not that important. You just kind of let it go. You, you had everything, but, but then you say, ah, it's not that important. And he says, I don't want to be a forfeiter. I don't want to be someone who inflicts damage to myself. And so I, I, I talked about that and I gave in, in the last teaching, I talked about several things that could cause that to happen. One of them uh, being that people reject faith and reject the, the conscience that has been cleansed by Jesus Christ. They're living in a religious mindset of condemnation instead of living uh, w w with a conscience that has been cleansed by Christ. Paul talks about that. And then he talks about people who get very zealous about inconsequential matters, things that don't really matter. And, and so, but I want to pick up from there. So we're talking about you having your full life, your maximum life not forfeiting, but enjoying God's best. So I want to pick up where I left off, and, and, and I think this will be a good standalone. You'll enjoy the teaching, and then I'll come back and share more with you. Watch this. Loving the world. What does that mean? Shouldn't we love the world, Pastor Peter? He says, God so loved the world? But he's not speaking about the world as in the planet with its people. It's talking about a system of values that are different from God's kingdom. 2 Timothy 4.10, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed. So here was a fellow, Demas, it's a great plan for his life, but what does it mean he loved the world? What does that mean? Sounds kind of threatening. Well, you know, there's certain values, certain things that are valuable in God's kingdom. For example, humility, would that be a good thing? I define humility as seeking dependence on God in what you do. Pride would be seeking independence from God in what you do. Like I'm my own person. Humility is a beautiful trait, but sometimes the world system doesn't value humility. It values you more if you're braggadocious, if you're condescending, if you look down on other people, if you step on other people. But God's kingdom values humility. God says that he will exalt the humble. It says uh, this present world. Now the Romans had their present world. We have a present world today. You know this, this, uh, what's valuable? I'm going to ask you this, not to make you feel bad, but just say, uh, what's valuable to you? How many likes you got on Facebook? Because you may be disappointed. Some people have their value. Like I read an article recently about young people in the church, born again people, and, and they were interviewing them and talking to them and said they had literally anxiety about going to youth service, but, but their clothing that they would fit in. They would look cool enough. I don't know. I suppose it's a, so the value is, is the clothes, the brand name. So I told you one time, I went into a, a men's store and they wanted to sell me this brand name shirt with a certain logo on it. So I said to the man in the store, how much are you going to pay me if I get that shirt? He said, what, what do you mean, pay you? Well I, well, I said, it's obviously that you work for this company. The logo was here. And you want me to be a walking billboard for that company. So I expect to get paid. You can't just think that I'm going to do it for free. The man just said, he was almost fainted in the men's store. But I was just making a point because I, I don't really, I mean, I can wear, you know, whatever little logo. That's not the point. I'm just saying, that's not my life. That's not my value system. People get caught up in this. It's so important to them. You know, it says in 1 John 2, 15, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. The world is passing away. That means this world system with its values are passing away. And the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. 
So here you have a contrast between two loves. You have the love of the Father, agape, the unselfish love that loves you in your darkest moment, loves you at your worst. And then you have the love of the world that can kind of go a little bit up and down. And they're, they're in contrast. Unhealthy cravings. Lust of the flesh. I'm back to the donuts. You know, you eat a pecan pie every night. It is no wonder that you haven't lost weight. I mean, it's not a miracle. And that the lust of the eyes, what is that? Well, it could be several things. It, but it, it, it could be consumerism. Just, just like I have to shop, I have to shop, I have to shop till I drop. You know, you go to the mall, it's like a temptation because there are temptations, little demons of shopping sitting in every store and they are beckoning you 70% off, 50% off, 30% off. Everything is off. Whole store is for sale. It's been like that. I know one store that I know for a fact has been like that for 40 years uninterrupted. They are closing and I went by there again, hadn't seen it for several years, and sure enough, the whole store has been for sale at least since the 1980s. <laughs> the pride of life. You know, the, the need to be con that condescending, feeling I'm, I'm better than other people. No, no, no. That, that's, the, that's the world system. And we get caught up in that. We could be forfeiters, do damage to ourselves. Now, let me give you more. Discontent. There was a fellow called Saul. He was king. And, uh, you know, the Bible says, be, be contented. See, some of us have a problem with that verse. Like, what do you mean, be contented? I, I want more. Well, if you want more revelation about God, you want more things to bless the gospel, that's one thing. But there's also a general discontent with yourself. And Saul had been anointed to be king. How many know that's a pretty good job, being king? But he says, I don't want to just be a king. I want to be the priest too. So he just, he was just unsatisfied. And so it says like this, he received this message, 1 Samuel, your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord sought for himself a man after his own heart. See, this fellow, Saul, he had a very good start. It says in the Bible, he was tall, handsome, and he was little in his own eyes. Isn't that nice? He was humble. He, was, he didn't think, I'm a big shot. But then this thing, he wanted what he was not. You know, you can suffer shipwreck over that. Now, I'm saying to people, people say, I want to become a pastor. I said, why? You're going to have greater judgment. <laughs> what? what? I just want to be a pastor so that I can do whatever I want to do in church. That's the last thing that happened to you. Poor Pastor Nathan, he can hardly do a thing he wants to do. I mean, some of you, you could just take Sunday morning off and say, oh, I feel like it. I have a little sniffles. I have a little flu. I feel a little hot. He can't even do that. He can't even get sick. He's not allowed to. Not allowed to. I feel a little bit moody today. He's not allowed to. He can hardly do a thing he wants to do. No, I think he actually wants to do the good things, but I'm just saying. So, so, people just... Parents, can I talk to parents? You don't want your kids to be forfeiters. Don't tell your kids, oh, little Charlie, 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 Charlie. You can be anything you want. He can't. He can't. Well, little Susie, you can be anything you want. No, don't tell them that. Help your child to discover their talents and their gifts and what they're good at. And then help them to be the best they can be in that area. Because if we got kids coming out of high school thinking, I can be anything I want to be. No, you can't. For example, you can't play in the NBA just because you want to. You mean, I feel, I feel trampled upon. My values are being trampled. I want to play. No, you can't. You can't. There's a lot of things you can't do. You say, well, I want to be a concert pianist. Do you play the piano? No. I go, twinkle, twinkle, little star. Well, but I want to do it. I feel, I feel humiliated. Well, you can't. But, but, you know, I always say, you can't make a dairy cow into a Kentucky Derby racehorse. No matter how much you pray for the dairy cow, you say, oh, I impart the racing anointing upon you, dear uh, dairy cow. No, you believe for that dairy cow to produce more milk than any other dairy cow in the whole country. So, some, you know, we live in a celebrity culture, so people want to, they want to be somebody else. Maturity is actually one of them. 
signs of maturity is that you're actually comfortable with who God made you to be. You don't have to try to be like anybody else. If you're a preacher, you don't have to try to preach like anybody else. You, you just are who God made you to be. And you say, I'm happy. I have Christ living in me. He gave me my personality. It may seem funny to some, not funny to others, but Christ manifests through my personality. He lives through me. Stay in your lane. Here's something else. Cowardice. It says about Queen Esther. You know, she, she was beautiful. She must have been really beautiful. And so, but there was an evil man there, Haman, who wanted to destroy her. She had to help her, her uncle Mordecai. And God wanted to work through Esther. But the question is, was she too afraid or would she step up? So we read like this. If you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews because it was an anti-Semitic movement by this Haman trying to destroy the Jews. So deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So in other words, step up. Esther, God's hand is on your life. I say that to you today. God's hand is on your life. But you know what we all have to realize? What God was saying to Esther, you know, you're not the only chicken in the coop. You're not the only game in town, Esther. God is going to fulfill his plan. It's going to happen. What God said is going to happen. And you have the chance to step up and say, here am I, send me. But you also have the choice of forfeiting. Saying, nah, I don't have the boldness. And then God will still have his way. But somebody else will run your race. How many don't want that to happen? You want to run your race? I tell you, here we are. We believe in God for a worldwide awakening to the reality of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's what I still believe in. I don't know where you're at. I believe that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I still say, God, give us the nations. Give us the ends of the earth. Give us whatever resources. Give us the workers. Give us the finances. Give us the wisdom. Lord, I thank you. I believe in a world awakening. How about you? Workers, maybe, maybe, maybe you say I should step up and be a worker. Ah, somebody else. Maybe God wants to work in finances through you. Through you. I grew up in a home where the source of contention was always finances. Because by the 23rd or 24th of the month, we were broke. Always. Our month was too long. You know, if we could only have 23 day months, we would have been fine. It was from the 23rd to the 30th day. That's when we got into trouble. Maybe you grew up, so I understand. It's a curse to not have enough. But could it be that people who feel like I don't have enough, could it be that God actually would like to partner more with you in finances? But instead of saying, God, I'm going to partner with you, you're squeezing the queen till she cries, holding on to every loony and toony, whatever we got on them, beavers and squirrels. You know, in Canada, we have all kinds of funny looking money. And you say, oh, I'm on a hoard. I'm on a, I'm going to get all I can and I'm going to sit on the can. Nobody's going to touch my stuff. Well, then you're on your own. Could it be that, that God is, you're in a good church for this? Because this is a church with a world vision. Are you ready to step up? Is somebody willing to step up and say, God, I want to be a banker for you. I want to be a financier. I want to be the one that you can trust God with money. Because we wouldn't want you to become multimillionaires and then we never see you again. I would say to Pastor Nathan, you know, those people, they were struggling. The fenders on their car were flapping. They had rust everywhere. What happened? Oh, Pastor Nathan would say, they did a good business deal, and, and now we don't see them anymore. They are multimillionaires. Last weekend, they were in the Bahamas. This weekend, they're in Las Vegas. Next weekend, they're flying over to Honolulu for the weekend. I said, ah. Oh, why did we pray for prosperity for them? I said, we, we, should have, we should have held it back. They were more useful in the kingdom before they hit the big. How many want to hit some pay dirt? 
and still be faithful to Jesus. Well, I want to get back to that teaching in a moment. I want to share five. There's five things that Paul says here in my main text, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, about how he avoids being a forfeiter, how he avoids being the person who is cast away, how he runs the race successfully. I think it'll help everybody quickly, quickly, quickly. Stay with me here. First of all, do you get a magazine? If not, you need to get it. That's all I can say. Text me, e email me, go online, call, just make sure you get this publication. Uh, I mean, uh, it, it will really, really encourage your stories from around the world, reports of what God is doing, teaching articles, you'll have all that. But I can't send it to you unless I, I know that you want it. I think it'll just be a nice something in your home, on your coffee table. People will look at it. It'll open up discussions, show it to your kids, your grandkids. And then uh, order this teaching, Prophetic Insights for the 2020s. Uh, it, you, you know, there were some very strong insights that the Lord gave me at the beginning of this decade. And uh, I want to share them with you, three CDs. So that is available there. If you want prayer, if you want help, you have all the information. But right now, I want to go back to the teaching with those five uh, principles that Paul shares from his own life, and it'll help us. 1 Corinthians 9, I am free from all men, yet I made myself servant to all. To the Jews, I became as a Jew. To them that are under the law, as under the law. To them that are without the law, as without the law being not without the law towards God, but under the law of Christ, which is the law of freedom. To the weak I became as weak. I am at all things to all, that I might by all means save some. I do this for the gospel's sake, that I might partake in it with you. Don't you know that they which run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run that you may obtain. And everyone that strives for mastery is temperate in all things. I therefore run not with uncertainty. I don't fight as one beats in the air. I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest I myself should become a castaway, that I would kind of forfeit, self-inflict damage to me. Let, let me just summarize this. I think there's at least five principles here, but I'm going to very fast. First of all, he says, I am free from approval addiction. I'm free from people. I'm free from approval addiction. You know, to run your race, your joy cannot be in somebody else's head and their approval of you. Poor Simon Peter, you know, when Jesus said, one of you will betray me, he had such an approval addiction. He said, oh, not me, Lord, not me. Like... Shut up, Simon Peter. At least keep your mouth shut. You're going to be the one that actually does the betrayal, but he, he had such a need to be accepted. Everybody said, no, 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 it's not me. Then he's sitting with a young girl at, at the campfire there, and, and the girl says, oh, are you from Galilee? Maybe you know Jesus. Oh, no, 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 I don't know Jesus. So now he's so insecure, he has to even please this young stranger because he has to fit in. He so much needs approval. You know, I, I just want to make sure. Don't look to others for du your direction and approval. Look inside. Look at the Christ that is in you, who is the umpire of your life. Learn to sometimes say no. And oh, it's a two-letter word. It's powerful. And you can say it nicely. Some people have such an approval addiction, they can't say no. But you can say it nicely. You can say, thank you for offering that, but I, maybe I will do it later, not now. That's a nice one. Or you might say, I will do it, but not now. I'll do it in two hours when I have time. And oh, because you keep saying yes to everything. You could end up going to business with the wrong person. You could end up, I was thinking about sex again now. You could end up saying, oh, I just want to be accepted. So you end up in a terrible relationship. You have sexual relationship. You, you sell out your body. Don't do it. Because you have Christ in you. Know who you are. Then, then, then he says, I'm a servant to all. 
He says, you know, I can encourage others when I feel like I need to be encouraged most myself. He says, you know, to the Jewish people, I'd be a Jew. To the Gentile, I'd be a Gentile. To those who are under the law, I'm like under the law. And to those who are not under the law, I'll be, to the barbarians, I'll be a barbarian. I'll be whatever I need to be, not compromising Jesus Christ. That's how I feel. It doesn't matter to me. I go to a church where they all take off their shoes. They think the ground is holy. I'm not going to bother explaining it to them. I take off my shoes too. I have bigger fish to fry. Don't get caught up in that. Don't get caught up in outward things, but serve people. A transcendent purpose. He says, what I do, the reason I do it is for the gospel's sake. Do you have a transcendent purpose, something beyond just to satisfy myself? i tell you something. You know, people say that once you, once you get a certain amount of money, you kind of have the same satisfaction in life, and it's not that much. It's actually below the average household income in Canada. People say it doesn't really matter. You know, one time I was invited to a home of a very rich person, a multi-billionaire actually, and I was invited there. And I was sitting and he was serving me blueberries and pineapples and bread and juice. And I had a revelation. His blueberries don't taste any better than mine. In fact, I have had better blueberries than this. Because some of you think, oh, if somebody's a billionaire, their blueberries must be awesome. No, no better than mine. True. I've had better sandwiches. And this particular person, he had a toothache. I didn't have a toothache. He had. You see, see, some of us, you know, you can only do so much. So for me, money, what is the incentive for money? Once you have enough, you can only wear one pair of shoes unless you're Imelda Marcos. Then you need shoes for morning, noon, and night every day of your life. And if you don't know who she is, don't worry about it. Uh, those from the Philippines will know, okay, at least for sure. You, you know, don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry. You, you, cannot, you cannot buy any more happiness. So, so when I talk about money, I want money for the gospel. I want to influence people. That's, that's why I want money. You, you know, you can, only, you can only have so many suits and so many whatever you have, so many pajamas. I don't even like people buying me T-shirts. They say, don't buy me a T-shirt. I like my old T-shirts. Tina. She tries to throw away my old t-shirts. She said, no, 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 don't throw them away. I don't, th- I shouldn't tell you this, but can you bear with me? You know, I was over in Indonesia and I had these old shoes, these shoes that you wear without socks. And Tina's telling me, you need to throw them away. I said, no, these are my favorite. Somebody said to me, you know, said after three, four months, they start smelling. I'd had them for 10 years. So, so, so I, I said, Tina, I'm bringing them to Indonesia. When I walk around the room, I want to have these favorites. I just don't throw them away. She said, I'll buy you new ones. I don't want any new ones. I want these. So I'm sitting there in the hotel lobby, and this nice family comes up. Very nice, rich-looking family. And they want me to pray for their daughter in the hotel. So I begin to pray, and I'm praying. I'm thinking, something smells. <laughs> I'm thinking, this family looks so rich and wealthy and they look so, why do they stink? And then I realized it was my shoes. You see what I'm saying? So I had to bury them after 10 years. I, I said, Taina, they're gone. I buried them in Indonesia. She was so happy. True story. I tell you a true story. We want money. We want influence, not for self, but for the gospel. Temperance. She says, I'm temperate. It means discipline. Study. You know, go, coming to church on Sunday, it's got to get in your blood. Don't forsake the assembling of yourself together. It's like, it's like I, what? I'm, I'm like, I feel wrong if I didn't. It, it's good to come together. Giving. Winning at it. He says, I fight to win. <sighs> Don't whine. Complain. Having an entitlement. Don't forfeit. You know, one of the reasons we give an invitation for people to receive Christ, because frankly, when you lift your hand and say, I want to be included in prayer, what you're saying is this, I'm free from other people's opinions. It's not that you couldn't go home and crawl under the cover and and say, thank you, Jesus, that you are my Savior and confess him. You could. You could do that. But the reason we say, would you acknowledge it? Because it's kind of a way to break free. 
You're stepping into that lifestyle of the Apostle Paul. Well, first of all, I want to make sure if you're watching and if you have not received Christ as your Savior, the, the invitation is there for you. And, and, and God loves you. And there's nothing that you have done that could possibly make God kind of turn his face away from you. No, no, God has never changed his opinion on you. Whatever you have done doesn't change his opinion. He, he loves you. And so we would love to pray with you. You can call the number on your screen. If you'd like to receive the material, I've given this to millions of people, literally millions of people. This little book that's Salvation, God's Gift to You. And now we also include this 42 page little tract here that is really jam packed full with good information. I'll send that to you, but I need to hear from you. It's free. Text me. Text me your contact information, go online or, or just call there and we'll send it to you. Now, in the closing part of that teaching, I was talking about money. And, and really, once we have what we need to get by in life, you know, money can, cannot buy you any more happiness after that. You have, a, you have a car, you have a place to live, you have shelter, you have food, but, but money for the gospel. And uh, th this need is so before me. Uh, you know, we, we are taking on bigger and bigger projects. You can see some of the pictures here that I'm sure my producer is putting on right now. Uh, the governor there in, in, West, in Eastern Indonesia welcoming. You see him right there and you see that great crowd. I think there's a picture there from the drone. You can see that and, and, and just people responding to Christ, people running towards the platform to respond to the invitation to receive Jesus night after night. And, and then we were training pastors on this particular uh, campaign I just finished. I think there was about 800 pastors and leaders. You can see that there. And then, of course, our, our, our Bible school in Indonesia and all over the world. We're doing all this because Jesus said it's important. And what Jesus said is important to us because because he's my savior. His gospel means something. It's not just, oh, that's what Jesus thought we should do, but let's just do our own thing. No. Would you help us? Would you become a partner? You've been seeing for the last minute or so on the screen how you can become a partner. I need your help. Thank you. We're running 20 campaigns this year. Help us make it possible. Thank you so much, and you are loved. Thank you. Your participation makes this global gospel ministry possible. To share your prayer request or to help bring the gospel to those who have never heard it, call 416-745-1820. You can give at www.peteryoungren.org or send your gift to World Impact Ministries at P.O. Box 62039, RPO, Victoria Terrace, North York, Ontario, M4A2W1 or P.O. Box 433, Winchester, Kentucky, 40392-9800. Together, let's give everyone a chance to know God's love in Jesus Christ.